Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm going to just introduce, and, and it's all Liam. Um, so we're very, very happy to have you here today. Our first uh, presentation today is Liam Corcoran, University of Rhode Island, and I'm going to let Liam take it away. Thank you all for being here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Liam Corcoran. As I was introduced, I am a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island. I will be presenting my research on the breeding season ecology of eastern oils on managed landscape in Rhode Island. One of these managed habitat types or landscapes is the early successional or young forest. Early successional forest is characterized by this extensive shrubby growth and also uh, establishing sapling trees. You can see in the two pictures, there are two different sort of variations of this. It can either be incredibly open where there are no trees um, with the canopy or it's uh, under an open canopy. It's sort of the undergrowth under the open canopy that really needs uh, a lot of light access for this growth to regenerate. This habitat type is one of the stages of what we call forest succession. It's early successional forest. Um, succession essentially just means the aging of the forest. So it goes through various stages, um, as we all do as we age. Uh, we start out with, say, an abandoned farmland or a grassland area. As it becomes colonized by woody shrubs or sapling trees, those sort of tend to take over, they grow, and then eventually the trees take over and then they end up with a mature forest stage, which is most of the forest um, is mature forest. What we're focusing on is this sort of first part of that before we get to the mature forest. And that comes as these grasslands the shrubby growth, the small trees, up until that. The reason we're focusing on this habitat type is because historically, natural disturbances such as wildfires, fevers, um, Native Americans propagating wildfires, um, and windblown events, storms, they have opened up the forest and created these patches of where the forest can start regenerating gen and uh, promote this shrubby growth. But those, due to human disturbance, have declined over the years. And so now we have to actively mimic those processes. And we do this by managing the land. And that can take the form of many things. Two examples I have here are cutting. That can either be selective cutting, where they, they just take a subset of the trees and they leave some open canopy, or they cut down all the trees and they open up the whole area and it, so it regenerates. The other process is we can mimic wildfires by doing prescribed burns as well. One of the species that is uh, that utilizes early successional forests is the eastern whippoorwill. You can see here in its um, full range map that it breeds extensively throughout the eastern portion of the United States. It winters along the southern coast, but primarily in southern Mexico and into Central America. As I say, we pointed at that. Maybe so. Oh, I see. Okay. Good night. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just to give you a little bit bit of background on the Easter Whippoorwill, well, they I, they are an aerial insectivore and they are nocturnal. Um, they primarily feed over these early successional areas. They feed over grassland areas, shrublands, um, under open canopy, through natural corridors or trails, stuff like that. And they primarily feed on small body to medium sized moths. Uh, as you can see in this photo, we happened to catch this individual and it just had a mouthful of moths for some unknown reason. This is the first time I've ever caught an individual with food in its mouth. Uh, <laughs> but you can see it, it loves moths. Um, and they're because they're nocturnal, they are mostly active at night, primarily dawn and dusk. But they are intertwined with the lunar cycle, so they will become much more active with the level of lunar illumination. So during periods of full moon, they will be most active and they'll be active well into the night. We've showed up at field sites, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and they are just very active, very vocal. Um, and the reason we're focusing on whippoorwills is because their populations have declined significantly throughout their age, 70% since the 1970s. Now, this is sort of on theme with, you know, losing 3 billion birds. This is, this is a very good example of that. And the reason primarily is habitat loss, and also the loss of food because they are insect insectivores, they eat bugs. 
We have this video here. Hopefully it'll play it by the So you're hearing a whippoorwill call. There, that's how they get their name, whippoorwill. And then in this video, I don't know if we can play it again, hopefully. You'll see they do this, what we call a sallying behavior. So they don't feed on the wing like a swallow would. Um, they sort of sit in this perch. They are visual predators, so they wait to see if the bugs fly by. And then once they see something, they'll go up, grab it uh, with their big mouths, and then they'll go back to their perch. And then they'll continue to do this as they feed. So the objectives of my research are twofold. One is looking at the movement ecology of these individuals, how these birds move on managed landscapes, and the other is looking at how they nest on these landscapes. First, we'll talk about how they move. So we had to track these individuals. We had two field sites. Both of these are management areas that are actively managed for early successional forests by RIDEM. Uh, they are Great Swamp and Big River. And just to give you a better idea of what they look like, you can see in the center that they're pretty heavily dominated by these central grasslands. And then as you go out, you can see um, sort of the shrubby areas uh, and then the, the mature forest. So there's, there's a lot of habitat mosaic, as you call it, at these sites. First, in order, in order to track them, we have to capture them. Uh, we do this uh, in two ways. The primary method is using a mist net and an audio lure. The mist net, as you can see in this uh, picture, this is my colleague, this is Megan, who took the photo at, at, the, at the title. Uh, we use these very long and tall, we call them mist nets. Um, they're, they're composed of very tiny, thin threads, and their idea is that they're invisible to the birds, especially when they're distracted. And we also use an audio lure, which is just a speaker playing that with a whip call. Uh, we'll set this system up near a singing male, and in the hopes that that male will become curious and territorial, and it'll come in to investigate or drive off whatever perceived threat that um, that he's hearing, and then it'll be it won't see the net and it'll fly in, and then we can take it out and process it. The other method is using a thermal camera to find these individuals at night. You can see at the bottom here we have this is an actual photo of what it, a bird looks like through this thermal camera. This is not a whippoorwill. This is a big dog. You can tell by the very long bill. Um, and I believe that might be a brood of chicks behind them. But uh, this, is, this is essentially what it looks like in the thermal camera. And once we find an individual, we're searching at night, we see, oh, we can see the heat signature. Um, we can go in then with a spotlight and a hand net to manually capture that bird. Once we do capture them, we have to take a bunch of measurements and age them is the first thing that we do. And we do this by looking at the feathers. You, on this left-hand picture, this the ASY is after second year. That means this is at least its second breeding season. Um, whereas second year, this is the first breeding season after it was born. Um, we look, the, this red box here, we're looking at the primary coverts, which are the feathers above the primary feathers, white feathers. Uh, we're looking to see if they have any sort of coloration on the tips. On this ASY bird, we, you probably can't even see the differentiation between the primary coverts and the feathers, and the flight feathers. But on the SY bird, you can see that there are those, that cinnamon tipping on each of the, each of the feathers, and that's how we tell the age of the birds. The other thing we have to do is, say if they're a male or female, they have pretty distinctive plumage differences, uh, although you wouldn't see them if you were just roosting. Um, the males on their outer three feathers on either side have extensive white patterns, as you can see, um, which are pretty striking, especially at night when you get that big flash of white. Uh, and then the males, are, or the females rather, are um, have this really dull, like yellowish white, just sort of a small band at the tip of their feathers. In total, we captured 24 uh, rules. Um, 13 of those were males, eight were female and three were unknown. The unknown is just because they were juvenile birds and um, they were missing their tail feathers so we couldn't identify which sex they were. After we've captured these individuals, now we have to track them in order to look at their movements. Um, we put on this center photo shows a radio transmitter. Essentially, it's just a backpack that we put on the back of the bird 
and it emits a, a signal, a beep, every one to two seconds. And this is me actively tracking an individual. You'll see that I have a an hand antenna, and I have another device. It's a radio receiver, and it has a speaker on it. And I'm listening to the beep, and then you can see we just found this bird. Um, this, what I just did here, we, is a, essentially a welfare check. So the day after we capture an individual, we check on them, we flush them to make sure that you know everything's right after a capture. You know, it's pretty disruptive, but then they bounce right back. Um, and then once we do that once, we do not flush them for the rest of the season. We do get as close as possible without disturbing them, and we do this three to five times a week uh, for the remainder of the season. So capture can be anywhere from April to June, and then we track them until basically until they leave. At the end of the season, after we track them, this three to five times a day, or a week rather, we end up with these. These are just a bunch of dots on a map. These represent an individual GPS point that I took for an upper. Each of the different colors is a different individual. Um, so we're tracking multiple individuals at the same time. Um, and then this is what we end up with. And what we do with this is we plug these GPS coordinates into a statistical software that will then estimate what we call the home range. And you can see that it sort of extrapolates out and creates an area around where those points were. And that tells us an estimated area of where we, where based on the points that I track, where these birds were spending all the time. Okay. What we can do with this is a few things. So home ranges, we can look at the size of the home range. We can compare the sizes between sites. We can also compare the size between the sexes. So do males have larger home ranges than females? Um, and we can also look at the overlap, which is particularly interesting for um, looking at the overlap potentially of adjacent males. Do males have an overlapping home range? Or looking at pairs, so male and females, do the female home ranges fall entirely within the male home ranges or vice versa? The other thing, sorry, is habitat selection. This is very important for management um, because we can identify within these sort of estimated areas what types of habitat that these birds are selecting for, what they're choosing to be within. And we can compare that with sites that they're not in at the moment. So we can identify key areas that these birds are tending to use. Next, I'll go through the nesting ecology. So why nesting ecology? Well, it's important for management implications. Again, it's a step, um, I guess, adjacent, not beyond, uh, adjacent to looking at the movement. It's just another facet of their life cycle that is important to know in order to effectively manage them. It's also novel information for this species in Rhode Island. This is the first study on whippoorwills uh, in Rhode Island ever. And so this is the first information that we have about their breeding in the state. Just some background about their nesting in general. Um, they nest in both this mature deciduous forest and early successional patches, um, and they do not make nests. So unlike you know a robin that's building a nest cup, they just pick a spot, they lay two eggs right on the ground, and then that's their nest. They don't they don't do any sort of building. Eventually, a depression will form after. You know, they're incubating for a while. They do, they move around a lot, moving the eggs. Um, they have to leave to feed and their body weight just forms sort of a depression, but they don't build any sort of nest cup. Uh, incubation for these chicks, they last approximately 21 days. And then once they hatch, they hatch out what we call semi-precocial. That means they're, they hatch out with these downy feathers and they're sort of semi-mobile, unlike a robin chick who hatches out and it's just sort of this pink blob with no feathers, and it's just in a cup, yeah. Uh, and after about 15 days, they fledge from the adults, they become independent. Can everybody, uh, go back. Can everybody see that picture of the nest there? Yeah, so that's it. It's just, it's just two eggs right on the ground, and then they're so heavily camouflaged, you can see in this other photo that's right above that, this red box is identifying where the whippoorwill is on the nest, and it's like blends in incredibly well. 
For this nesting study, we had three sites also actively managed. Two of them are managed by DEM, their management areas. They are Tillinghast Pond Management Area, uh, Arcadia Management Area, and then one site was an Audubon property, which is where we took this, the, the photo of the title, which is Epic Preserve. In order to monitor the nests and kind of the chicks, we had to find them first. Um, essentially, we just, in each site, had to do walking surveys to find the nests. So we essentially walked in zigzag patterns, myself or with other people, um, just walking through the area, hoping to flush a female off of her nest. And then once, once she flushed off, we can identify where, where she came from. Once we flushed them, once we identified a nest, we placed a trail camera at the nest. We did this to monitor um, interactions between males and females during incubation. And after the chicks hatched, we looked at um, behaviors of just the females during incubation. Uh, we looked for a hatching date so we could actually confirm when these chicks hatched because, you know, we're only going there every, every so often. So we might not capture that exact hatch date. And we also wanted to document um, potential predation events uh, as well. After we put the trail camera and then we continued to visit. We visited approximately two every two to three days. And this was to um, check the trail camera, to check the eggs to see if they hatched. And then once they hatched and they were chicks, then we continued this two to three day monitoring in order to measure the chicks through time uh, until they either fledged or we couldn't find them anymore because they become pretty mobile after a while. And they don't stay within the nest. Um, and then once, so yeah, so we found eight nests total at these sites, and then we measured 14 chicks. Let me see if this is, this is so, this actually, this is probably um, hours after they hatched. This egg was still full of fluid uh, when we found the nest, and they were, both these chicks were pretty wet still. So yeah, these are, this is what they look at, very, very fresh. Uh, and so the idea of measuring every so often through time is to generate what we call a growth curve. It's just looking at how, at the, how the measurements increase over time. And the primary reason that this is interesting is that we can generate this curve. And then if we find a nest of chicks that we don't know their age, we can go to this curve and then make um, estimations based on measurements. So for example, this is showing the weight over time. And so if we find a nest that the chick, you know, that already has chicks in there, we measure them, they're about 20 grams. We can go over and estimate that they're maybe about five days old. So this is useful for that. We can also identify different influences of their growth using this. Um, and that, it, you know, site specific differences. So do they grow differently between the different sites? Are influences like weather sort of changing their growth rates depending on where they are? Stuff like that. This is preliminary data right now. I'm still working with this, uh, but this is what we're hoping to do for a variety of measurements that include weight, um, the length of their legs, the length of their um, the humerus in their arms, and stuff like that. And with that, I will take questions, but I, how many minutes are left? You, you got about three more minutes for the talk, and then oh, you have five minutes for questions, so we're good. Okay, so. I do have a bunch of videos that I'd like to show you as well. This is just in case I didn't have time. Um, so this right here, which you may or may not be able to hear. So this is a male and female on a nest. On the left is a female on eggs. And then the, the male has come in. This is about the time that they'll start feeding in the evening. And when the male shows up, they start doing this, um, what we perceive as a pair bonding activity where the female on nest will start doing this wiggle back and forth, and they're they're both grunting back and forth with each other. You may or may not be able to see their, the pouch, the gula pouch, the flap in front, and you can see it moving. They're sort of doing this grunting behavior. And this happens, this can happen every night, and it's very cyclical, it's very uh, on time too, so they you know maintain the same time every day, which is pretty, pretty cool. This we have here is a female um, coming back to chicks that have hatched recently. And what you'll want to pay attention to is once the female 
approaches the chicks. It should be the second. You'll see the chick latches onto her bill. See right there? This seems to be the trigger for the adults to regurgitate food into the chick's mouth. So they, they'll latch on to the, to the bill and then you know, they may hold on for a minute and then, then that'll trigger the adults to feed. So they get found to be very not like oh, an insect or something. Yeah. And no, so it, it will be an insect. It's oh, just, just filling their mouth. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to say anything about this one yet. So this was one of the only attempted predations that we had of the nest that we monitored. Uh, this was 20 minutes before we showed up to monitor this nest. Uh, so we showed up, the female was back on her nest, uh, on her egg incubating, uh, and we had no idea this had happened until I you know, looked at the footage later. I was like, oh my, oh my, oh my God, I, this, this you know, death battle happened <laughs> minutes before we showed up. Uh, but this egg hatched and this chick, um, made it to, I think, age nine or 10 before they became too mobile and, and we couldn't find it anymore. Um, so we don't know exactly if it fledged, but uh, we do know it made it, it hatched and it made it to a certain age. Um, one other thing you'll notice in this video is that this down here, this is a, this is the second egg in that nest. She had kicked it out earlier. Um, I can't show you any video of it because the video basically doesn't show anything. But what I think happened is that a slug predated that egg because we have very grainy video, just a couple seconds of this amorphous blob on or near this egg. And then she subsequently kicked it out. And then when I, when I looked at it, it had a hole in it. So I'm assuming it might have been a slug, but I don't have exact um, should, uh, proof of that. But uh, yeah. Oh, okay. great. I didn't know slugs predated eggs. Right, yeah, <laughs> very, very strange. This is another interesting uh, thing that we caught. This is obviously this is a great catbird. Um, it's approaching a worker will egg. Uh, that, so this nest, this female had just laid this egg um, and then I evidently thought something was wrong or off because uh, she just abandoned it almost immediately. And the eggs were left there, and we still had the trail camera out for a few days after that. And we found this capper that found the egg and started um, eating the liquid that was inside. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. And I have one final video. Just kind of funny. Um, yeah, just happened, happened to capture a woodcock feeding right in front of a, right in front of a woodcock. Um, it's sort of unique uh, footage. You don't really get to see uh, Woodcock eating that much, you know, probably, uh, probably the ground. You don't really get to see that. Um, and one final thing I'll show is that one of our birds uh, that we tagged, uh, this was actually not related to this VHF study, this tracking study they did. This was a bird that was tagged at Francis Carter Preserve. Um, we were able to detect its southbound migration in part um, this past fall from Francis Carter, and at last was detected in Veracruz, Mexico. So, um, very interesting to see one of our birds make that super long journey down. <laughs>